Hello everyone, I'm Sergio Maldonado and this is Masters of Privacy, a set of interviews covering the intersection of marketing, data, privacy and technology with a clear goal in mind, which is redefining the relationship between people, brands and media around transparency and control. Which is to say, we're aiming for real customer centricity, or if you will, human centricity. We regularly talk to DPOs, CMOs, CDOs and whoever else we find interesting and able to share valuable insights. So we hope you like it. Please do reach out if you have any ideas on future topics or speakers. Okay, we are back with the interviews and we have Ito Onojegwo here with us. She has worked as an independent DPO with a large number of businesses in the UK and across the world. She is the CEO at AllNet Law, which is also a leading IAPP training partner, delivering official courses from the then again IAPP, so International Association of Privacy Professionals. I have in fact been delivering a few CIPP courses, so GDPR related courses for for her, for AllNet Law in the UK this year, even though now I'm already back in the US. But uh, I can attest that Ito has put together one of the most professional offerings I have seen in terms of test-oriented training. She is really good. With Ito, we will address today a very important topic still untouched, which is effective privacy notices. Let's get on with it. Ito, finally, thanks for joining me. It's actually an honor, and um, I am actually indeed looking forward to it. And um, so let's go. Thank you for the invitation. You're a true master of privacy, so I'm very happy to have you here. Uh, and Ito, you know, I was really hoping to cover privacy notices. And, and for you to help DPOs and in-house lawyers and other people that are not so familiar to understand the basics of it and how to do it well. So how do you go about this thing? What is your first generic tip or how do you fit them in the context of compliance? First of all, when we talk about um, privacy notices is um, having a privacy notice as a way to demonstrate transparency. And so this actually does not just cover um, demonstrating transparency in terms of being a uh, demonstrated accountability is not just about the uh, popular article 12, 13 and 14 of the GDPR, which has to do with the contents of the privacy notice, but also it also we also need to refer to the first principle of, of the GDPR. Article 5 talks about the first principle is uh, data needs to be processed lawfully, fairly and transparently. So you can actually say when we talk about the privacy notice, we're also covering the transparency pr um, principle. And it's quite interesting in the sense that some people may say that um, transparency is subjective, but it isn't. In the sense that um, uh, Article 12 of the GDPR talks about what we need to do to ensure transparency. On the concept of objective transparency, right? Uh, I think this is very interesting. I had an interview yesterday on the Spanish channel and and we discussed that the audience that you talk to determines what's an effective language, but that doesn't affect the core principle, right? So would that be your answer to people who said who would say transparency is subjective and the level of your audience in terms of understanding the concepts determines how transparent you are. Absolutely, I totally agree with that. In the sense that um, when we talk about even the privacy notice, you could have um, an employee privacy notice. And so when we cover in terms of using um, clear and plain language, now for employees, you could have technical jargon, which they understand. And so if you have an employee privacy notice or a data protection policy, which you need to use suitable language for the target audience, then of course it has to be the language you understand. And if you're using 
um, the technical jargon to use within the organization, then that will be suitable. So yeah, so at the end of the day, what we need to think about is the target audience to demonstrate transparency and to ensure that it is indeed objective would determine, would have to do with the target audience. So yeah, uh, one of the um, examples of how you could have um, ensure transparency might be, uh, well, well, there are three popular ways, but let's, let me touch on using, should I say images, but that's not, would not be suitable. Images may not be suitable for particular target groups and maybe just children, right? So at the end of the day, the fact if I wouldn't want to read a privacy notice with loads of images around, I like reading text. So at the end of the day, we need to think about our target audience and um, to understand what methods the approach to use. I also say a privacy notice is work in progress. So if something doesn't work, if you're getting many complaints or questions, then it means you're not transparent enough, right? Yeah. So that's something we need to think about. Then there is a sort of a conflict, right, between the effectiveness of the, of the message and how well you communicate what's happening given your audience, and the minimum pieces, the minimum, the minimum elements that must be there as per the GDPR. So how do you strike a balance? All right. So now, in terms of, again, it also has to do with um, service being provided. Now, I've, got, uh, I've worked with over 50 organizations as a data protection officer in the last five years. Um, some in the capacity of being a data protection officer or a consultant. And um, I remember early days um, when GDPR was just enforced, I had a particular client, which I'm not going to disclose now. Now, um, in terms of the privacy notice, based on the retention period, we just had a generic, generic and acceptable information on how long we store the data for. But for that particular client, um, they kept on getting requests um, to re erasure, right? And um, yeah, so it made me realize, okay, but, but for that, but basically based on the lawful basis on which the client processed the data and based on the legal requirements, it had to do with transactional data. So of course they couldn't delete, they weren't, they shouldn't delete the data. And so they ha we had to respond to each client, no, we cannot delete the data and so on. And then I realized, you know what? Elaborate on a privacy notice. And um, I don't think it was a coincidence, but as long as I remained the DPO, we never got any such request to erasure, right? So at the end of the day, when we are transparent to your target audience, that also helps build trust. Now, the same language used initially for that client five years ago, I use it today with clients and we have not received or we do not receive such requests to erasure because it's not required. We don't need to elaborate as much, right, with the current clients, right? So at the end of the day, that's why I say it's work in progress. When we talk about like retention period, of course, you need to get ready to have your retention schedule, doc any form of documentation to provide if clients require more information. And of course, in terms of amount of detail, that's why we can consider having a layered approach. So it's not about putting too much information, but of course you could have some information and maybe a link to provide additional information if, people, if anyone requires more information. Yes, to ensure that the notice remains concise. So you touched on very, two very interesting things. One of them, there's the feedback loop that I find super interesting. It's like the iterative approach that we have to products in software, where you are measuring and see how people react and respond to the product and the product gets better and better. And so the longer you've been in the market, the better you are. And there's something like this here. By being there and getting requests and seeing what people are asking for, then you know what's missing in the notice. And then you see that in the end, you're saving time in the same manner as we've got like self-service data subject access requests and plenty of self-service tools for like portability and so on. 
So with retention period, let me go through that, follow that path now for a second. So in a privacy notice, correct me please. Uh, so if we do not give them, if you do not give people the specific retention period, you need to be ready to tell them how you calculate the period so that, okay, maybe I'm not going to tell you it's six months, but I must tell you how I will know how long I need to keep it for. I don't see many privacy notices where they go beyond very b vague and broad terms. I applaud when someone's really ready to commit to six months, two years, five years, even though it sounds like a lot, at least they commit or to explain how they would calculate it. And this is in the law, right? What's your perspective on that specific part of the privacy notice? Okay, now let's think about this. In terms of the privacy notice, um, there are different privacy notices. And are we talking about the privacy notice we find on websites? So then we're talking about the private, if it's the one on the website, which we most of the time we see, it has to do with the data collected um, by um, the control, the organization collects of um, the website or uh, visitors, right? Good point. Yes. So, and in terms of the retention period, that would needs to go back to legal basis. So, um, what are you relying on? What kind of data? What is the purpose? So, yeah. So it depends on um, the period of time. And so, of course, yes, I would commend um, organizations that would break down and talk about the different types of data. So for marketing data, this is how long we keep the data for. But why should you talk about employee data at that stage where you have your employee privacy notice? So there's no point going into that because in your employee privacy notice, you can talk more about that and um, have a detailed um, retention period. Also, or in the candidate um, application privacy notice. So it just depends on the topic, the content, and what um, data subjects we find relevant and um yes because at the end of the day we may by the time we put so much information at the end of the day um it's no longer as concise and um so i think it's about sticking to what is relevant very good so because i've seen that as well so some people trying to be exhaustive and trying to be you know comprehensive and to have like a you know 70 page privacy notice so that we feel that they've done their homework then they're dumping everything from how they collect like you know candidate cvs which in the end have a separate application which should maybe have a separate privacy notice so you're on the website and you're right if it's an e-commerce website there's certain things that you collect that are very important you build a profile maybe you have recommendations if it's a publisher's website then there's going to be advertising so the nature of the website will be super important but if you are then doing other things, you're hiring people, you have a whistleblowing policy, all of these things, they have a separate, they have a life of its own. But you touched on one thing. Let me ask you then about this one. So the, the elephant in the room okay. is the legal basis. So we keep teaching people that they need to know what they collect data for, that they collect as little as possible, whatever is required for that purpose. And then we keep telling people, now that purpose needs to be tied to, so whatever you've done has a purpose and now you need a legal basis. And you've got the six lanes in your highway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You use that metaphor and I love it. Yeah. And so out of those lanes, uh, let's say that those that are most handy to, to most people, the contract, consent, legitimate interest, I keep seeing people that use plan A, plan B, plan C. So, okay, I rely on consent or legitimate interest, or I keep seeing this thing where in case this doesn't work out, what do you think of this? At any given time, we can only rely on one lawful basis for a particular purpose. You could collect the same data for different purposes and rely on different lawful basis. A very straightforward one, I would say, is let's say collecting employee data, right? And um, you collect employee data uh, in order to pay them and um, 
that may you may be relying on contracts for that contractual necessity. And um, if you are in, in under the jurisdiction where the employees pay taxes and that information may be shared with the tax office, that will be based on the legal obligation of the controller. So these are two lawful bases, but for different purposes. So it's not a case of um, if you don't consent, then we rely on legitimate interest. No. Right. So, yeah. So you may have two options, legitimate interest or consent, but you decide on what you're relying on and employees would need to be informed about it beforehand. Of course, at a later date, you might decide to switch. But then again, data subjects would need to be informed or if the data is going to be used for another purpose or if there's a reason, a genuine and lawful reason why um, the, the legal basis, should I say, has been changed. Thank you. Thanks for that. Because, I'm, I'm, you know, again, these days, I'm, of course, pretty obsessed with the whole idea of a privacy notice and trying to build tools to make it easier. And so there's something that, that I've seen. Uh, so a colleague of mine recently uh, was sharing, and this is a very good example, I think, these recent changes on a product's privacy notice, which is also very interesting, consumer products, consumer electronics, you know, Everything collects data these days. I just bought a mattress that collects data. <laughs> it's like a smart mattress. It's crazy. Oh, wow. <laughs> Another day, I'll tell you about it. But this, the fridge collects data. It connects to the Wi-Fi, right? Uh, every TV now, of course. So Sonos, which is the speaker, right? So they just changed the product. I love the product, I have to say. But yes, they changed their privacy notice and their policy. And they notified customers. And so these, these my colleagues sent it over saying, look at this. What do you think? And so one thing they did, which I find makes a lot of sense, is they changed the legal basis for the data they collect in the manner in which you use the product on a daily basis. Let's say that these are logs on how it performs. And they're moving it from the contract, the contractual legal basis, to legitimate interest. I said, I understand it because they explain what the legitimate interest is. It makes sense to me, right? But then I saw something very interesting, which is that they open that little door or that big door or they get their foot in the door and then they start adding other pieces of data and then other purposes. And I haven't seen additional legal basis. It's like all of these purposes are then dumped on the back, you know, or, or thrown on the back of legitimate interest. Example, marketing. Example, personalization. Things for which I would expect another legal basis. They're all sort of clustered together. And maybe I haven't read it well. I received the policy in German. I did my best effort. So maybe, you know, please, you know, sorry to Sonos if I got it wrong. But my perception is that this is not, well done. And in consumer electronics, this, this is very important. So to, to close this chapter with, with legal basis, I know that when you get to the point of putting together your privacy notice, you should have already decided on everything. You know what you're doing. But once you've decided, do you have a favored approach to communicating it, to being transparent about it? Some people use a table, you know, data, purpose, legal basis. Some people use paragraphs. Do you have a favorite approach to this? Yeah, I actually um, find um, the table um, more user-friendly, but I must say in terms of the ones, uh, the most of the privacy notices I've developed, I hardly use the table. But when I see a privacy notice where you have tables, in general, it looks um, more user-friendly. Yeah. It looks a lot clearer. And, but most of the time for the table, is, um, that's most useful when there's so much information to put in, in terms of based on the different lawful bases. I think that's the reason why it is clearer. So um, talk about what, what you mentioned earlier, whereby there's a switch from one lawful basis to another, and then data subjects are informed. But then um, the businesses now sneak in some of the options. Of course, we know it, that's not right. They're not being transparent. And also, um, the fact that a, um, a, a, an organization, an establishment, 
informs us of the lawful basis that relied on, that doesn't mean it's their 100% right. Okay, we know of the case of uh, Meta and relying on contracts for, for, for marketing and all that, which isn't right. So that could be a reason why there is the switch. If you realize that, okay, we've been relying on contract and that's not right, of course, it needs to be corrected. So sometimes the switch may not just be because they want to use more data or, or collect more data. It might be to rectify um, what, they had, what the establishment had done incorrectly beforehand. Yeah. Right. So whichever way. But at the end of the day, um, being transparent, um, if, it's, if the establishment is genuinely being transparent, I'm sure that would always be welcomed by their customers. Yes. And Ito, so what do you think about keeping track of these changes? So you have all of these changes and some people keep a history of versions, like version control of the privacy notice. That's pretty tricky on a website. Yes. Okay. In terms of the versions, it is good to have the version control. Of course, not on the website, um, but of course, start somewhere. Because at the end of the day, um, the controller would need to demonstrate, particularly when relying on consent. So if you've relied on consent or whatever you have, um, if there's going to be an investigation, um, the controller would need to be able to demonstrate what information was provided at a certain time. And so that is some way of demonstrating, um, uh, of being accountable, should I say. So we need to have this record in place that could be reviewed and improved on. So. That would be the reason why we have different versions, I would say. That could be the reason. So we can see, we can understand what changes internally, why we have improved, reasons we have improved on it. And again, also to be accountable. Accountability principle. Very, very good. Because yes, if the, someone had read your notice or did something, you know, on the basis of what you had published in August 2023, and then, you know, it changed, then you've got, yeah, you've got a, um, a history of that. Okay, so now to, to finish with this, to, to round it up. So we have the privacy notice. We know the things that need to be there, whether you collect data directly from, from the data subject or from a third party. We know all the pieces for that. We've got the GDPR. So as you said, 12, 13, 14, articles 12, 13, 14. But then we put it together and then we see that some people even though they, in principle, have every section. So what do we collect? Why do we collect it? What's our legal basis? Which are our legal basis? Um, you know, how long do we keep your data for? Do we send data over to any third country? You know, what about security? All of these pieces are in place. Automated decision making. <laughs> yes, very good. Excellent. Thank you. Yes, automated decision making. You know, your right to appeal or whatever to a data to, to yeah. an authority. Once everything is put together, even though everything may be in place, then you've got things like Spotify's recent fine. And I know it's it's pretty recent, but they received, I don't know if it's 50 million Swedish kroner or 5 million euros. I can't remember the detail. I, I did cover it in a newsroom recently, but it is. So, of course, it was Max Rems. So, NOYB. Always, he's in every story, right? Like in every course, he's always present. So, NOYB had uh, complained to the authorities that Spotify was not really uh, responding to data subject access requests. The authority said that wasn't correct, that they actually did did comply with that, but they still issued a fine because they said even though we do not believe what the complaint is saying, we do notice that there is an issue with the privacy policy, as they were calling it, and, and certain things are missing, certain building blocks are missing. So then you think these people, they really tried to make it simple. They tried for everyone to understand what was going on. I even think I saw back in 2018, like two separate policies at Spotify, one for consumers and one for the lawyers to get entertained with the, the elaborate pros. And yet they were fined. So it's quite an interesting one in the sense that um, talking about, yes, they have um, a clear enough privacy notice, but the question here was about how they responded 
to subject access requests in the sense that um, they did not clearly inform the data subject how the company used the data. I believe that's what um, the issue was about. So it may have been that there was an, a clear, a useful privacy, no a, well, seemingly useful privacy notice, but what was important, how they used their data, they hadn't been informed. So yes, we have the data, but how they use the data, they weren't um, informed. But I would like to add another one that I think is very interesting. I don't think um, we have a result yet for that, but that has to do with an airline, which um, Shrems is currently after. Okay, so um, now we have the right to, well, um, in terms of the different data subject right. Now, right to access, right to rectify, there should be no cost, no charge for that, right? So this airline has no charge. However, when people make requests, I mean, people could, cannot, there's no tool, no, me, no um, uh, clear method or, or, or process in place for people to make this rectification. And so there was a lady that um, needed to amend her records. The only way she could do that was to make a call. And the call for each minute they had to pay. She had to pay. So at the end of the day, they claim they do not charge but they do indirectly and again okay. that's transparent okay right so yes so for something like that such a request yes they dealt with a subject access request but they have charged indirectly and they weren't transparent about it so that gets back to goes back so you have to call the, this crazy expensive line for a dsar press <laughs> eight yeah <laughs> but i think at the end it costs um close to 40 euros right yeah. for to, to amend someone's um, name <laughs> yeah yeah and then good luck dealing with whoever is in the call center and explaining yeah. what you want oh yeah <laughs> i can't oh what a nightmare that's that's killing me you put me in the wrong mood to finish this now now i'm, I'm picturing <laughs> myself calling one of these uh nerve-wracking call centers this is a very good example so ito any last tips that you would add to everything we've said for a proper privacy notice, an effective privacy notice? Well, with regards to tips for an effective and a useful privacy notice, I would say is, um, yes, of course, the starting point might be work with a template, but I would say it needs to be modified to suit the, the establishments. I see a lot of templates or notices that are clearly from templates where all it is copy everything, and when you talk about the rights, um, the establishment would list all the rights under the GDPR. Yeah. Now, we say you have the right to data portability, right? Meanwhile, there are rules for data portability, for when a data subject actually can enforce that right. First of all, um, the controller has to be relying on consent and contract, and the data would need to be processed automatically. And so I've seen that being used whereby, no, you do, the data subject doesn't yeah. have the right to possibly. So why have you said there? Yeah, copy, paste. Yes, copy and paste. So the main thing there is if you want to have all the headings, then you can say, based on the type of data we process, you cannot, you do not have the right to data possibility if you just want to have that on there. Thanks for that. Thanks for everything. Great tips. Okay, then. Thank Thanks you. Again. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Okay, that's all for today, and you will find some episode notes and links to our social channels on mastersofprivacy.com. Thank you for listening.